Welcome to episode one of season eight, the season premiere of the Gospel of Games podcast. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about tulips. Not the flower, but the unbiblical doctrine of Calvinism. Let's get after it. Thank you for joining me for the Gospel of Games podcast. I'm your host, Richard Storm Norman, back again to tell you everything I know. Some things I highly suspect. I feel like this would be a good time. We do this at the opening of every season. You know, we might have some new people watching. And uh, like I always say, there's nothing I hate worse than listening to a podcast and being like, oh, this dude. He's pretty good. And then, you know, you're pretty far along into it, and then you find out he's like a raging heretic or something, and he believes in some ridiculous thing that you didn't even know about. So I just tell you up front what we believe around here. At least me, because I'm the only one doing it. And I'm sure you figured out if you read the description, though, uh, King James only, independent Baptist, believe in the King James Bible. Pre-trib rapture, you know, I don't know what else there is to say. <laughs> I mean, once you, once you kind of tell people that you're King James only, they kind of get the idea of where you fall on the rest of things. So, I mean, you know, we're going to do an episode on Calvinism today. You kind of know where I'm coming from. So, yeah, if that bothers you, then you can go ahead, turn it off now, and you've, I've saved you a bunch of time. Of course, if it don't bother you, then by all means, stick around. If you're not King James only, that don't bother me. If you're, uh, I mean, well, kind of does bother me, but I'm not going to give you grief about it. If you're a Calvinist, that's sad. I wish you weren't, but, you know, it's all good. We Anybody who wants, who, anybody can tune into the podcast. It's a free country. I'm just letting you know what you're going to get. You're not going to hear me talking in tongues, and you're not going to hear me preaching the five points of Calvinism we're going to talk about them today, but I ain't going to advocate for them at all. You're not going to hear me reading out of an NIV or an ESV unless we're doing, you know, one of them episodes. Uh, but yeah, that's what you, what you see is what you get. I mean, you can kind of tell from the signs. can't really see this one because I changed my camera up. I need to move that or something. Uh, there you go. Today we're going to talk about Calvinism. Uh, this was a listener request from last season, and I realize I've never done a whole episode on it. So here we are. And it's going to be pretty basic. We're going to do like anybody else would do. We're just going to take a look at the five points, which spell out tulip. We're going to take the five points and see if they line up scripture rightly divided. Scripture rightly divided. If you don't rightly divide scripture, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. That's how you get Calvinism. Uh, but we're going to look at it rightly divided. Before we get into that, though, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm recovering from COVID. Been my second week back at work today. Uh, it was not fun. wasn't the worst thing I've ever had, but it wasn't fun. Uh, and I still got this lingering cough that just will not go away. Hopefully it'll go away soon. So until this cough goes away, the uh, joyful noise segment is going to be on hiatus for a little while. And if you notice my voice changing, that's me trying not to cough while I talk. It's difficult, but it's not as bad as it used to be. It is getting a little bit better. Uh... But we're recovered from COVID for the most part. I don't have to take a COVID test at work now for three months. So that's cool. I'm getting stuff stuck up my nose. And uh, I can't I can't get it again for a little while. So that's good. My wife's fine too. She got fine before I did. I think she went to get vaccinated today. I don't know. But uh, yeah, the only thing is though, if y'all could pray for her family. Uh... Because her, everybody got it. Uh, 
her mom got it her grandma got it unfortunately her grandma, her grandma didn't survive it though so we uh she passed away so if y'all could pray for her and her family as they're dealing with that uh weather it's wet it's wet outside it rained on the way home not too terribly bad but yesterday man it was torrential downpours I'm telling you but you know that's how it is this time of year and you're like man it's hot it's hot all day you're it's hot it's humid it's hot and then about three four o'clock down it comes uh, it's just the the schedule of events for florida in the summertime new store i turned my air conditioner off so i wouldn't hear it in the background already it's getting hot in here uh a new store i told y'all last season i was going to either add new t-shirts to the teespring store or get rid of it altogether. so I, i'm going to get rid of it it's still up as of right now but i'm going to get rid of it i started a new store at another website called printful this store is not it's not uh active yet but i got two hats two two hats no i got a hat i got a trucker hat i made a trucker hat that has the logo on it and you can get it in all kind of colors and different whatnot i think there's two colors for the hat uh and you can get the t-shirt like we had uh on the teespring store you can get that and you can also get it in a women's cut thing i don't know how that works uh, but John, if you're a woman, I'm sure you know. And I got other other designs. I got one that has the podcast logo. And on the back it says, Take it across and carry on. And I got one. I think I got one other t-shirt I designed. And I cannot remember what it is. But I think it has the verse. That we use it then to close out the podcast. I think it has that verse on it. And it has the logo on the sleeve, maybe? I'm not sure. I probably should have known this, for, but it's been like... It was before I got COVID that I did all this. Or really right when I got it. Because I was at home 10 days on quarantine, so I worked on it. But it's been over like two weeks since I worked on the store. So. But that store will be going... I said I was going to launch it at the same time as this premiere... But I, I, I'm, I don't know. I need to look at it and figure because it's new. You know, it's a new site, and I need to figure out exactly the rules and uh, how to do that stuff. So, and yeah, we'll get it figured out. It'll be launched real soon. Bibles I've been using this week. Uh, I actually been using the Ruckman and the Common Man's because I taught Sunday school yesterday. Today's Monday. Taught Sunday school yesterday, and we went verse by verse through Matthew 24. So I use a bunch of study Bibles and stuff, mainly uh, Ruckman and the Common Man's hand size on both of them. Anyway, we're already getting pretty long on the opening segment, so let's get into the main topic, the unbiblical flower. Oh, by the way, I don't know if y'all noticed, I moved my book, my little bookshelves I got moved them up here hopefully it's not blocking your view of the board too much back there but then i had to move this up here so I don't, i'm not sure if i like it but it's okay we'll, we'll we'll go with it for now okay anyway i remember a few years ago i was really interested in the topic of calvinism because uh if you've ever heard me talk about the reason i started this podcast because there was so much Calvinist content out there and not none independent Baptist type stuff out there that I could find. So I started this podcast. But I was really interested in Calvinism back then because since it was everywhere, I'm like, well, I want to know what this is. You know, by interested, I mean, I just wanted to know why people would believe in something so incredibly unbiblical. And, you know, I'd try to listen to their arguments like well if so many people believe in it they must have some something you know and i'm like 
No. Nah. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I grew up a church kid. Uh, they weren't able to bamboozle me. But it used to be fun to argue with Calvinists uh, in different Facebook groups. But the more you deal with Calvinists and see what kind of gymnastics the proponents of Calvinism have to do to make it work, it's just not as fun anymore, you know. Uh, now I'm to the point where I kind of lump Calvinism in the same category as people who believe in evolution and flat earth, you know. They're just too dumb. It's too dumb a subject to argue, you know. I just don't know how you can read through your Bible and come to that conclusion. Uh, but before we begin, anytime you mention Calvinism, you must be aware of the little trolls that like to pop out from under rocks making the accusation you don't understand Calvinism. You know, anytime you try and shed light on what it really is and what it ultimately leads to, oh, you just don't understand Calvinism. You can save your energy if that's your plan. Just letting you know. Calvinism has been around for hundreds of years. If people can't understand it by now, then maybe that should tell you something. You know? Well, you don't understand Calvinism. Well, you've been teaching it for hundreds of years, so maybe you're not doing such a good job, or maybe it really is trash. Anyway, let's, let's stay civil. Let's stay civil. There are many things we could talk about in regard to Calvinism, but we'll keep it simple by just breaking down their favorite acronym, TULIP. This is a handy way they have come up with to organize their soteriological beliefs. The T, starting with D stands for total depravity now if you take that on face value as what it says and what you think it means i think most of us would agree with it right oh yeah we're totally depraved absolutely romans three twenty three says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god all have sinned so you could look at that and be like oh yeah we're definitely totally depraved however however what they really mean is total inability, not so much total depravity. They mean total inability. Or that because of the fall that mankind is completely incapable of coming to Christ. Meaning that unless God intervenes, you will never respond to the gospel because you can't. Because you're totally unable because you're so depraved. We would all agree that we can't save ourselves. You know, at least I would hope so. If not, you're probably done stumbled onto the wrong podcast. But the Bible clearly puts the responsibility of responding to the gospel on us. I mean, that's all in the scriptures. Like I said before, I don't know how you can believe in Calvinism, read your Bible, and still believe in Calvinism. You just don't understand it. Uh, Romans 12, 3 says that God has given all of us a measure of faith. Let's read it. Romans 12, 3. Let me get thumb indexes. We got quite a few places to go. Romans 12, 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt every man the measure of faith. Has dealt to every man the measure of faith. John 5, 39 and 40. There's your daily dose of hot rod screaming down the road by my house. 5, 39 and 40. Search the scriptures for in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. If they're unable to come to him, to be saved, why is Jesus telling them? <laughs> right there in verse 4, and you will not come to me that you might have life. They could easily, you know, Calvinism's true, but well, we can't. We're totally enabled. We can't do it. It sure makes Jesus sound silly if man is totally incapable of coming to him and he's calling them to come. We can't, God. Matthew twenty three thirty seven. I think this is a verse we're going to visit again later. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, 
and you would not. We can't. Jesus said, I would gather you, but you won't come. We can't come. We're totally unable. See how silly it is? The U and TULIP stands for unconditional election. This is another one that sounds good at first, uh, but doesn't hold up scrutiny quite too well. We can look at this by saying everything that happens is because God decreed it to happen. You hear that and you might think, well, amen to that, brother. Amen. Calvinists mean everything. Now, some of them will deny that. But that's what they mean. It's the logical outcome. If you follow something, a belief, an idea all the way to the end, that's where you get with Calvinism. About everything, murder, rape, child abuse, evil, anything, all because God decrees it. Everything that happens is because God decrees it. They might try to deny that, but like I said, that's the logical conclusion to that way of thinking. Therefore, if you are saved, it's because de decreed it long before you were born and you had no say at all in the matter. None at all. God created you either for eternal life or eternal damnation. But does everything happen because God decreed it? Does the scriptures agree with that statement? Look at Proverbs one twenty four through 30. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not on my counsel and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would not of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. It sure sounds like people are doing the thing God didn't want them to do. But if he decreed it, he's saying, I, dec I decreed it and you didn't come. You didn't, you didn't heed. Luke 730, God decrees everything, huh? But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized. How can they reject it? It's decreed by God. If God wills it, it's got to happen. And it says they reject it. Can't, you can't reject it? See how silly it is? Let's remember the disciples' prayer. Uh, you know, Some call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer. But in this prayer, I'm sure you all know it, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now I ask you this, if God's will is always done, always, there's nothing we can do to thwart it, then why do we need to pray for it to be done? Why do we need to pray for God's will to be done on, in earth as it is in heaven if it's always done? There's nothing we can do about it. That's because we do, we do have the ability to do what God doesn't will. God doesn't will that anybody should perish, but yet we do it all the time. We do reject the gospel when people die and go to hell all the time, even though it's not God's will for that to happen. The Calvinist order of salvation, or, or ordo salutis, whatever they call it, says that since we are so depraved, God must regenerate us. So that we can want him. You know, what kind of stupid nonsense is that? You know? Well, you can't want God until God makes you want him. What? Paul gives us the correct order of salvation in Ephesians 1, 13-14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession un unto the praise of his glory. So it tells you right there how the order of salvation. You heard the word, the gospel, then you trusted, or then you believed, then you were sealed. There was no, that's the debate between Calvinists and 
everybody else who ain't a Calvinist, they say regeneration precedes faith. That's silly. It's not what the Bible says. The Ellen Tulip is probably the most blasphemous of them all, as far as I'm concerned. Limited atonement. This is the idea that Jesus only died on the cross for the elect. He only died for the elect. If you're one of the elect, he died for you. If you're not, not so much. You've probably heard it said that Calvinism is a house of cards. You can't remove one of these beliefs without the rest of them falling. Which is why you really, you know, people say, oh, I'm Calvinist, but I'm just a four-point Calvinist. Or I'm just a three-point Calvinist. You really can't. You really can't be. Because it kind of all falls apart if you remove one of them. So as far as the Calvinist is concerned, if God predestined you before the foundation of the world, which is another verse they get wrong, uh, then you you can get saved. Then Jesus died for you. The Bible says that Jesus died to everyone could have the opportunity to get saved. That's what it says. Everyone. Is everyone going to get saved? No. But God is a just God. And it is not at all just. To create someone with the sole intent. Of sending them to hell. You know people. When they hear Calvinism. They'll be like. Well that's not fair. And the Calvinism will be like. Oh you don't want God to be fair. No. But I want him to be just. Because the Bible says he's just. You don't want God to be fair. He'd send us all to hell. That's what we deserve. You're correct. You're correct. But he he is just God. He is a just God like the Bible says. And it is that is not just. Your view of that is not just. Let's look at the most basic verse. John three sixteen. I don't even gotta turn there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth in him. For God so love the world. 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 6. Verse 4, who will, ha- who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Weird it doesn't say uh, just the elect. It says all men. Now what Calvinists will tell you there is, oh, it's not talking about all. It's just talking about the elect. It says all there. That's what I saw. Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all. Oh, that's just the elect. It says all, bud, to be testified in due time. If all meant some, then that's what it would say. But it don't say that. Second Peter 3, 9. I'm sure you all know this one. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise that some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The list goes on and on. Y'all. We could sit here all day and read verses like that off. If you're alive and breathing right now, you can be saved. The elect is whoever is a member of the church. Whoever is born again into the body of Christ, church, you're the elect. Let's move along to I... Irresistible grace. God irresistibly saves all that are elect. They have no choice whatsoever. If man is incapable of choosing Christ, then by golly, Christ will go choose him. A lot of times the Calvinists will substitute the word irresistible for effectual. In their proof text, John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him and I'll raise him up. At the last day. Another verse they take out out of uh, context. The Calvinists will say, oh, you know, grace can be resisted, but ultimately it'll overcome man's will. Or the general call of the gospel is for everyone, but the effectual call is only for the elect. I mean, I kind of want to say that one again. The general call of the gospel is for everyone, but the effectual call is only for the elect. Now let that kind of stupidity roll around in your head. Not too long because it might infect your brain. But that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Sounds like a bunch of hogwash, don't it? There's plenty of examples of God's grace being resisted in the Bible. John 5, 39, 40. 
think we already looked at this one earlier. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they and they are they which testify me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. They're not coming. Meaning they're resisting the grace. Resisting the effectual call. Matthew twenty three thirty seven. I think we already read this one. Old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy, thy children together, even as hen gathered hen, chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Once again, people, you know, rejecting the grace of God. Acts 7, 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. But I thought it was irresistible. How are they resisting? Weird. P. Perseverance of the saints. This is one that really trips up a lot of people. Uh, if you believe in eternal security. Or once saved, always saved. As some call it. Then it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking this is the same thing. It is not. Now, y'all know I believe in eternal security. Once saved, always saved, whatever you want to call it. But this ain't the same thing as that. This is different. This is the idea that a person will persevere in the faith until death. If they don't, then they were never saved to begin with. Their proof text being 1 John 2, 18 and 19. Let's go there. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. <clears throat> this, this text, that two verses we just read, rightly divided, is referring to the tribulation, not the church age. That's what John's talking about there. The same with the uh, with another proof text they use, Matthew twenty four thirteen. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I just taught on this yesterday in Sunday school, and the reason why Matthew twenty four, and we I've done an episode on this probably more than once. Why Matthew twenty four is not talking about the rapture? People try to make it about the rapture and see like, see, Jesus is talking about a post-tribulation rapture, not a pre-trib. This ain't talking about the rapture at all. But this thing that he that shall endure to the end. Nowhere in the gospel does it tell us we have to endure until the end. It says we have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection and we'll be saved. We'll have eternal life. But sitting there and saying that he that shall endure to the end, that, that implies that you have to do something to hold on to your salvation. That's just not the case in the church age. But anyway, as far as Calvinism goes, like I said, this verse is also in referring to tribulation saints because they do, in the tribulation, they do have to endure to the end. They do have to keep the commandments and have the faith. We don't have to worry about that. We're not in that, we're not in that age. 2 Timothy 2, 11-13. I was going to read Ruckman's note on this. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we also shall live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. This is another of the Calvinist proof text, and I just want to read Ruckman's note, because it sums it up very well. The, this denial has nothing to do with salvation. According to the first part of the verse, it is the denial of a millennial reign with Christ. Verse 13 makes it clear that Jesus Christ won't deny himself. And if you are saved, you are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. If you quit believing on Christ after you are, in, after you are born again, that wouldn't change your destination whatsoever. Nothing can separate you from Jesus Christ, as Romans 8, 38, 39 says. So, perseverance of the saints sounds good. But it's not the same as eternal security. Uh, you can get saved and you can spend, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years living for God 
as hard as you can live for God, passing out tracts, witnessing to people, feeding the homeless, you know, just being the most ideal Christian you can be. And then in 30 years, you can be like, ah, I'm done with this. You get out of church, get out in the world, just start living worldly. I don't mean you ain't saved. If you believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're saved. Even if you go out and start acting like a fool, you're still saved. It's called eternal life. If, it was a, if you could lose it, it wouldn't be eternal life, would it? All right, that's all I got for today. You know, uh, I have this video from way back called Judgment of the Amalekites. And that's one of my most commented on videos as far as, you know, it's still getting comments. I don't remember when the last one was, but that's one of the videos people just always want to argue. I don't know why, but people just always want to argue and they'll post comments on there every now and then. And I'm like, man, this is videos old and still people still mad about it. <laughs> I feel like this one's going to take the place of that one because I know. Some people just really love their Calvinism and they're going to let it drag them straight to hell. But uh, if you're a Calvinist, I don't think you're not saved, you know. Uh, I think you, you if, you're sa if you're a Calvinist, you, you can be saved. I'm not saying you're not saved is what I'm saying. But uh, you got some really bad doctrine. Really bad. And I know you're going to hate this video. And I know I'm probably two, three years from now. I'm going to get a notification on my phone that someone commented some hate on this video. But it is what it is. Somebody asked me to talk about it. And I talked about it. Calvinism's trash. It just is. For all the information you need regarding the podcast, including social media, how to support financially, how to be saved, and information on me, your host. If you want to know who it is you hate. Check out the website, gospelregiments.org. If you want a t-shirt, I mean, you can go hit the Teespring store up if you want to. Um, but it's about to close shortly. And the new store will be up, I don't know, sometime in the next week or two. As soon as I get on there, and do, it might be super simple. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll check it out. If you like what you saw today, subscribe, like this here rate review follow all those things don't cost nothing before i go let me ask you are you saved changed up we changed up my verse this year i think we used the same one the last two or three seasons in order to be saved you must put your faith in the gospel of the grace of god don't know what that is i'll read it to you from first corinthians 15 1 through 4 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures." The death, burial, and resurrection. If you believe Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. Believe that in your heart. You can be saved. As long as you're breathing oxygen right now, and you can hear my voice, and you got blood bumping through your veins, you can be saved. That's all there is to it. God, believe in that, and you're sealed till the day of redemption. Nobody can take it from you. Hello? Well, my timer says we're almost at 40 minutes. So I probably can edit this down to 35 maybe if I'm good. We'll see what happens. Till next time, take your cross. Carry on.